you know, the universities say, well, you've got to take this and you've got to take that in order to apply to our university. But here are people who hadn't taken anything. (laughs) Some of them had been at this school from from four years old on. They'd never gone to a regular school. They'd never taken a course. And then they decided they wanted to go on to a college and they got in, (laughs) including into some rather prestigious colleges, the kind of places that, you know, that kids uh, get all tense about, you know, getting into. So today I am joined by Peter Gray, a research professor at Boston College, author of the books Free to Learn and Psychology, a college textbook. He's published research in neuroendocrinology, developmental psychology, anthropology, and education. So Peter Gray, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, Can you share a little bit about how you got into your fields of study? Uh, Yes, I've I've been uh, in this field of looking at children's play and children's development, children's learning. for many years now. Uh, I didn't start off that way. I started off more as a brain scientist. I was studying the effects of certain hormones on the brains of rats and mice, uh, happily doing these laboratory experiments. Um, I would, I I really got into this. um, (laughs) Some people will not be surprised by this, um, who have children, (laughs) by my own son. who uh, was rebelling in school. He was, he started uh, what was supposed to be a very fine suburban public school um, and he hated it. He fought with the teachers all the way from kindergarten through fourth grade. Uh, We were constantly being, his mother and I were constantly being called in. to what, what are we going to do with this boy who <laughs> refuses to follow the rules, <laughs> and mm-hmm. who is being very rebellious, very deliberately rebellious. Um, and uh, he finally, in my book, Free to Learn, I tell this, the full story at the very beginning of the book, but to make a somewhat long story shorter, I ju- we, uh, we finally determined that uh, that was not school was not going to work for him. The school didn't want him. He didn't want to be there. (laughs) His mother and I were tired of fighting about it. And uh, we decided we really had to listen to him. We had to be on his side. He hated school. He needed something different. What we were going to do. This was a long time ago. Homeschooling was not um, as big a thing as then as it is now. Um, and we were not really in a position to do homeschooling anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so we looked for uh, alternative schools. We visited some progressive schools in the Boston area, which we couldn't have afforded even if he <laughs> did go there. Uh, but fortunately for us, he didn't like them either. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so finally we found... Um, I, I, I shouldn't say we just found it. I knew about it all along, but we had been kind of avoiding it. There, the, this really radically alternative school uh, that was fairly close to where we lived, a couple miles away from our home in Framingham, Massachusetts. And um, so we went there to visit and uh, my son came with us and um, he saw what was happening. He looked around and he said, if this is not just a show, this is what a school should be. This is, wow. and um, so we enrolled him there. Um, so, th- so how did this lead me to in my line of research? So, this school is so very different from anything that most of us think of as school. That I like, like many parents, maybe like the great majority of parents, um, was concerned. <laughs> Um, I was happy that he was finally happy and the twinkle was coming back in his eyes, the joyful, my joyful son was there again. And um, he was clearly learning, he was clearly, you know, intellectually engaged, he was making friends, he was, um, he was, uh, this was working for him. Um, But I had the concerns of, well, 
what if he stays here all the way through high school? Um, is this going to limit his options as an adult? For example, if he wanted to go on to college, could he do so with, from this radically different school where there's, there's really literally no courses. If students want to create a course, they can, but it only lasts as long as the students want it. And, um, and usually they can talk a faculty member into doing it, but it's only, it's only at the student's request. Um, my son, I don't think ever took a course there. Um, he, he was very happily doing all kinds of interesting things, but it was not anything that looked like what we think of as school. So I began to ask about the graduates. What are they doing? You know, are they living in their parents' basements because they can't get jobs? Are they, you know, are any of them homeless? Are they, you know, they, uh, but the, well, I, the stories I heard all sounded pretty good. But being a scientist, I didn't want just a few anecdotes. So I decided to do a systematic study of the graduates along with the help of a person who at that time was a part-time staff member there. And, um, and so we located, uh, between us, we located nearly all of the graduates at that time, about, if I remember right, something like 90 graduates who had people who had been at that school through what normally would be high school, though the school doesn't divide kids into different grades or schools. Everybody's, their kids there from age four to 18. They're not segregated from one another in any kind of way. They're not, wow. nobody calls them kindergartners or first graders or high school students or anything else. And in fact, um, we can talk about this later, but I think a secret to the reason the school works is because there's a lot of kids there over the whole age range and the kids are always learning from one another and this is makes it a very rich and learning environment so at any rate we we did this study of the graduates and it really uh, astounded me uh, first of all it led me to uh, relax about my son being there the graduates were doing fine in this world they were going on to higher education if they wished to do so not all of them did so. They didn't seem, many of them didn't feel they needed that for the kind of career they were interested in. Uh, nobody felt they had to go to higher education to learn, my goodness. They didn't know they'd been learning all along without any kind of formal education. Um, so, um, so, the, so, so not only did, but not only did it lead me to um, relax as a parent about my, child being there, but it absolutely intrigued me as a, as an academic. And it ultimately changed my, the course of my research career. I began, uh, I wanted to follow up that study. Um, so I published that, we published that study in the American Journal of Education. So that was my first publication in an education journal. And, um, and but I wanted to follow that up by fix, saying, well, so they now, by any reasonable definition of the word, these people are educated, uh, even though they didn't do anything that looks like school, they're educated. Mm -hmm. So education and schooling are not the same thing. And how did they become educated? What were they doing there? I mean, it looks like they're just playing, right? They're just playing, they're messing around, they're socializing, they're following their own interests. They're doing exactly what you'd think kids would do mm -hmm. when they're free to do what they want to do. They're not, you know, sitting down and studying algebra textbooks. They're not doing the kind of stuff that somebody might imagine that they would do, uh, uh, although it's hard to, for me to even imagine that somebody would imagine that. that <laughs> <laughs> but yet they are um, going out and, fell, and nothing about this seems to be holding the back, uh, mm -hmm. including going on to higher education. That was the biggest surprise to me. You know, we have this belief you know, the universities say, well, you've got to take this and you've got to take that in order to apply to our university. But well, here are people who hadn't taken anything. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them had been at this school from, from four years old on. They'd never gone to a regular school. They'd never taken a course. Wow. And then they decided they wanted to go on to a college and they got in, wow. <laughs> including into some rather prestigious colleges, the kind of places that, you know, that kids uh, get all tense about, you know, getting into. And mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, and so this was kind of mind blowing in a certain sense that it undermines a, what I've come to believe is a huge myth in our culture that you've got to go through school in order to be able to do college. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and certainly, I, I mean, I'd already been kind of convinced you don't really have to go through school or college to be a good citizen in the world and to get a decent job and so on and so forth. That's already a myth that I, I knew was kind of a myth. But the idea that even to go on to higher education, you don't need to do all that preliminary stuff. Mm -hmm. That was kind of, that was kind of surprising. And so so I also then, I got interested in play because obviously what children are doing uh, is playing uh, as they're growing up. And play, of course, evolves as you become older and a teenager. It takes on different forms from young children's play. But, um, but primarily they're playing, they're following their own interests, they're exploring, they're, the teenagers are hanging out, you know, just as teenagers do everywhere, talking about whatever it is that teenagers talk about. And, um, and they're going on just fine. And mm -hmm. so that was, that led me to really be interested in what I now call self-directed education, uh, which is um, how children's and teens, really in a sense, all of us are, are our natural drives to play, to explore, our natural curiosity leads us to become educated. Well, I love that. And that is exactly what so many people in my audience ask me when I have talked about unschooling and letting kids lead and following their interests. They're like, yeah, but how are they going to graduate? How are they going to get into college? Like when you're not following formal curriculum, when you're not making sure you're checking off all those boxes and making sure that they're getting this many years of math and this many years of science and all that, how in the world are they going to graduate? And so I love that you bring that up, that these unschooled kids who have followed their own interests and did not take those formal courses were able to get into college somehow, or they didn't go to college, but they have jobs that they're flourishing in. So let's go ahead and jump to that. That was one of my questions. Like, tell me how people that did not take those formal courses got into higher education. How, right. how did they do that? So I, so I can speak partly from that original study of the graduates of the Sudbury Valley School. That's the name of the school that yeah. I was talking about. But also, um, along with Gina Riley, who's a professor at Hunter College, um, I did a couple of studies of, um, of unschooling, home-based home unschoolers. And uh, so again, these are people who were not um, doing a formal curriculum at home. They were pursuing their own interests in a family that supported that and helped them find the resources that they, that the children wanted in order to pursue their interests. Um, so this is a different approach to self-directed education. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, when I first did that study, I was also skeptical about that. I, I thought, well, you know, this is a different kind of situation from Sudbury Valley, where there's a lot of kids, there's a number of staff members, all kinds of interesting things to do at the school and going on at the school. Mm -hmm. What about uh, self-directed education in the context of homeschooling? And so I, we did this study. And um, we did actually two studies. The first study was a stu was a survey of parents of homeschooling fa of unschooling families to 215 different families, if I remember right. Again, an understanding of how they defined unschooling, what the students were doing, and so forth, and or what they had done, because in some cases the the children were already grown up and had left the home. And then we did a study of 75 grown unschoolers to find out um, exactly how, what their life was like after finishing, after they turned 18 or whatever age they, you know, we regard them as grown up and out mm -hmm. in the world, what are they doing? And found pretty much the same finding as I'd found with Sudbury Valley years ago. Those who wanted to go into higher education seem not to have any difficulty doing so, even if they had never gone to a school before. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, and, and they were, and whether or not they'd gone to, high, on to higher education, they seemed to be in good jobs. They were making a living. This study was done at a time that was kind of a recession in the United States. And actually a lot of young people were not employed, but these people seemed to be 
pretty well employed and in and most important in careers that they seem to love. Mm-hmm. So here here's so sort sort of to get back to your question. For those who decide they want to go to university for whatever reason, mm-hmm. most often it's because they've chosen they're interested in a career that seems to require it. So mm-hmm. If you want to be a doctor, you can't just go directly to medical school. You've got to get a four-year. That's kind of a waste of time, but you've got to do it. You've got to do your four-year bachelor's program first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Similarly with a lot of other kinds of jobs. And um, and so people who are choosing the kind, who want to go into the, that kind of career are going on to college. Um, and there, But there are others who are going to college for as a professor, I could say the kind of reason that I wish all my students had <laughs> chosen, which is they just really wanted a liberal arts education. They were kind of, they, unlike the typical high school student, they weren't burned out about that. You know, mm-hmm. They wanted it. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've spent all this time kind of studying on my own and pursuing my own interests, but wouldn't it be nice to sit in the class and have everything presented to me in an organized fashion by somebody who's supposed to be an expert in this field and so you know right. so this is the kind of student that professors dream about having we you know they're one in a hundred but the uh, <laughs> or maybe yeah. a little bit more than that but so so those are the two primary reasons for going and, and then of course I'm sure that there are some who went on just because they felt like like uh, basically so many other people in the culture, well, this is just what you do. And, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe it's how I'll, how I'll meet uh, the guy or girl that I want to marry. Or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons people go to college, frankly. Yeah. So that's, um, so that's the, um, but so, so to get in, what do they do to get in? Some of them, uh, just got in directly, and I, I think they got in, including into prestigious schools. I'll give you, I'll tell you a little story about one. This happened to be one of the Sudbury Valley graduates, but similar stories for some of the unschoolers. So this was a woman who um, had somehow, as a teenager, developed an interest in economics. I don't know how. I don't know how a teenager gets interested in economics, <laughs> but. <laughs> I've learned that people get interested in all kinds of things, including even once in a while economics. So she yeah. gets interested in economics. She'd been reading advanced books in economics just on her own. Mm-hmm. And her favorite economist happened to be the chair of the department at Brandeis University, which is a pretty prestigious university, not that easy to get into. So she decided this was where she wanted to go. She wanted to study with this particular professor who was chair of the department. So she applied to Brandeis. She hadn't been to any other schools before. She hadn't, she didn't have any grades or school doesn't give any kind of transcript. They don't rank students. They don't do it. She didn't have any of the measures that schools usually look for. So I think, I think that what happens, and this is even more likely to happen at a more prestigious school than at a less prestigious school, is so she sends this application. She gives all kinds of great reasons why she wants to go there. She's very clear why she wants to go there. Mm -hmm. She's a good writer. She's, she's uh, knows what she wants. She's, um, and so it's, uh, it's kind of an impressive essay and it doesn't look like an essay written by a school counselor or a parent. It looks like an essay written by the applicant, right? (laughs) Who seems to be genuine. And, um, and this is kind of a rarity in applications. And so uh, as this is my imagination of what happened, that the, that, the, that the people looking at this said, well, what are we going to do with this? You know, it, uh, we, there's, no, there's no grade point average. She did well in the SATs, but people do study for the SAT test uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, it, for colleges. And, and, and it, one thing I've learned is it doesn't take a lot of work to be able to figure out what you need to do to do pre- pretty well on the SAT test. So yeah, she had that, but none of the rest of what the applicants did. So, that, so what they said is, well, we're going to have, we can't just dismiss her. We can't just throw this in the wastebasket. We're going to have to interview her. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I've discovered is young people who've grown up in this way are very good at interviews. They are not afraid of adults. They mm-hmm. are... Uh, 
you know, they look you in the eye, they don't feel inferior to you. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's kind of impressive. Um, and, and they are, and they are able to, um, advocate for themselves um, mm -hmm. because they're used to doing that. They're not used to being uh, shepherded around all the time. They're right. used to advocating for themselves. And so um, so she interviewed well. And then as part of the interview, she said, I really, I really, uh, in order for me to make the decision, I really want to talk to the um, this person who is the chair of the economics department. So she then went over and met with the chair of the economics department and um, you know, discussed his work <laughs> with him. Wow. And how many, how many seventeen or eighteen-year-old kids do that? You right. know? So, so I'm pretty sure. Again, I wasn't there, and I'm making this up. But my guess is that immediately after that interview, he called over to the admissions office and he said you know this young lady is brilliant wow. of course brilliant because she read his work but mm -hmm. so that's uh that's one example that's a somewhat extreme example but it illustrates i think a general principle that um very often people who have been in charge of their education take control of their life and they're they don't act like they're victims of this world they act like they they can do things and they figure they don't necessarily take no for an answer they figure out how to do what they want to do and mm -hmm. uh, that applies to getting into college as well as many things many other things now i should hasten to add that not everybody who goes on to college takes that direct route mm -hmm. um, a very common thing as you may know for homeschoolers unschoolers uh, and for graduates of schools like the Sudbury Valley School is to go first to a community college, a two-year yes. community college. Anybody can get into a two-year community college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frankly, anybody can. Yep. You know, as long as you, and the tuition is not great, it's that high, and, um, and, and it makes a lot of sense, I think, to go there. So sometimes kids will go when they're 15 or 16 years old, and they're mm -hmm. still doing their, you know, high school with quotation marks around it, but they're also taking a course or two. It's something that interests them. So they've developed um, a transcript at the community college that shows yep. they can do courses at that level. Mm -hmm. And then that helps them get into the four-year college uh, as part of their application. That's a fairly common route. Yeah, I, I've actually talked to multiple people in my my local homeschool community recently who are starting to put their teenagers, 16, 17 years old, in community college because they're ready for it. They're like, we're going to go sure. ahead, maybe not a full course load, but like they're like, I'm ready to go ahead and, and do a few of these things so that I can get my associates by 18 years old. And then I may go on to a four-year university or I may not. And exactly. I, I talked to one of the ladies recently. This was her like her last child out of five that she finally just got out of the house. And uh, And I said, so was it hard did our local community college like look sideways at you with your homeschool transcripts did they kind of like hesitate she was like absolutely not they were completely welcoming to her because she had met the requirements and they they let her come in so i've been hearing that so much from so many people being like go ahead and go to community college if they want to 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 get that experience at least and see if they want to keep pursuing things but it's not hard to get in at all. And it's right. such a great opportunity for people to try it out. Right, exactly. So, and, uh, you know, it's um, community colleges are great because they, they, you know, they offer a lot of practical courses. They offer, uh, you, and you can, and, and, the, and it's not all that competitive. It's not all that stressful. And so it's a, it's a kind of an easy way into higher education. I, I really think it's a, it's a good route. And, um, so that's so that's true. Now, for for those who didn't go on to university at all, or even for those who did, the other thing that I think stood out in these studies was that the great, as far as I could tell, essentially every all of the all of the grown on schoolers, essentially all of the graduates of, of the Sudbury Valley School that we studied were happy with their career, mm -hmm. and I think the reason they were happy with their career is the following. So. As children and teens, they had lots of time to play and explore. And what is play? It's 
pursuing your passion. It's it's doing what you love to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, as a result of all that play, they discovered what they love to do and they became yeah. good at it. And it turns out, you know, we, we talk about, and I can understand it, how the employment situation is difficult. At not Right now, it's not all that difficult in the United no. States, but it's sometimes <laughs> very difficult. Uh, and there are many people who are not happy in their careers, but the, um, but I believe, but we're such a world that if you really love something and you're really good at it, there's usually a way to make a living doing it. (laughs) And so, and so they've, they've done something that really, that they've, that they're really passionate about. And then they, at some point they say to themselves, uh, maybe as when they're 16, 17, 18, they say to themselves, well, I'm going to have to make a living. Can I make a living doing what I love to do? And, Mm -hmm. and they look into this and they figure it out and it may involve taking some courses, but very often it doesn't. Uh, Mm -hmm. It may involve some self-training. It may involve an apprenticeship of one sort or another. Uh, But then they go on doing what they really love to do. And this is, I think, one of the great advantages of self-directed education. If you are in a typical school, a curriculum-based school, then um, you really don't have much opportunity to discover what you love to do. You're spending all your time doing what other people are telling you to do. <laughs> right. And you are judging yourself based on other people's judgments of you <laughs> mm-hmm. instead of really, what do I want? What do I really enjoy? What do I, you know, is part of education is learning who you are, learning, learning about yourself. Um, and that takes time and it takes oppor- takes time really for exploring, for trying different things. It takes time for with socializing, those teenagers hanging out with one another and talking with one another, just discovering something about themselves through that mm-hmm. process. And so when you have that opportunity, you learn what you like to do, you figure out, you take control of your life. I also think because they have been in a situation where they're not being judged and they're not being graded, they're... Yep not being they're not working for external rewards they're work Mm -hmm. they're they're doing they're working if we want to call it work for their own satisfaction and their and finding meaning in what they their interpretation of meaning and so when you grow up that way you're not so concerned about status or high pay you want to make a living you want to Mm -hmm. be independent you want to support yourself if you want to, uh, but, but you're not motivated by extrinsic rewards to the same degree as if you grew up where the basic lesson is, you know, this is a competitive world and you're, you need to get the A, <laughs> you right. know, by working hard to get the A. And the, the learning is, is kind of lost in the wayside as you're working to get that a mm-hmm. so it, and i think that for people growing up in typical schools sort of the high status job and high pay is kind of the new a <laughs> it's mm-hmm. the new way of but if you did grow up that way then it has less meaning to you and you you are more interested in can I do with my life and my employment that is fun, that's meaningful, that maybe is contributing to the world in some way that I feel good about. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you choose your career that way more so than as what is the career that, that people will brag about me most for, (laughs) or that will lead me to have the highest uh, salary I might be capable of earning or pay that I might be capable of earning. So, right. the, so you know, just to give you, just to give you an example to illustrate what I mean. So, the um, one of the one of the graduates of um, Sudbury Valley in that original study was a was a woman who, uh, as a student at the school, was fascinated by boats, and she played with little boats on the pond at the school. And by the time she was a teenager, she apprenticed herself. She took advantage of the the fact that you can spend a lot of time off campus, apprentice herself to a ship captain on Cape Cod. 
and uh, very shortly, you know, certainly in her 20s, she had her dream job of being captain of a cruise ship. So, wow. you know, that's just one example. Another example from, this, from the unschoolers, uh, a kid who, this was a more recent study, and this was a guy who, uh, like a lot of people today, was really into making YouTubes and videos. It was, a, it was kind of a he was very good at this and had a lot of followers and um and his his dream as a result of loving this kind of thing was to become a movie producer so oh. he uh he learned that a major um film was going to be made in the city that he lived in mm -hmm. so he volunteered to help <laughs> wow. and he was still probably about 17 or 18 at that time he volunteered to help and um, the producer or assistant producer, whoever he was working with, was so impressed with his help that they invited him to Hollywood uh, wow. with a well-paying job as an assistant to, um, to a producer. And um, he was well on his way at the time we did his study to his dream job of being a movie producer himself. Very, at a very early age, you know, missing the whole thing of college, which would have been irrelevant to what he was <laughs> interested in and so mm -hmm. on. So those are just a couple of examples I could give in, in the papers that we published on these. There are many other such examples. That... Yeah. And, and I think that the key, listening to you talk about these things, it was not the parents who oh, no. were leading these children into these things the parents were just giving their kids space they were saying this is what you have access to if this is something that you mentioned that you're interested in i will let you pursue that i'll give you resources or i'll take you somewhere that you want to go pursue this but it really i think that a lot of new homeschoolers feel the pressure to be like if i don't teach my kids this then they're not gonna find their hopes and dreams, or if I don't do something where it's really, it comes from the children themselves. Exactly. You know, we, we greatly overrate teaching. Uh, yeah. You know, people don't really learn from teaching. People learn from being interested and immersing themselves in it. Right. Teaching might help. So if somebody, let's say, you know, somebody gets a real passion, they've been playing around with the guitar or the violin or some musical instrument. They get a real passion for it. Mm -hmm. Now they really want to do it. And if that student says, I want a teacher, I want yes. somebody who's really an expert to work with me on this, mm -hmm. that's great. That's very different from requiring your child to take music lessons. Right. <laughs> but the same applies to everything else. It applies to math. It applies to it applies to everything else. If the interest isn't there, if the self motivation isn't there, you can force the person to go through the motions of learning that stuff. You can mm -hmm. even force them in such a way that they do well on the test. Right but they haven't really learned. How many people, you know, pass the language requirement in high school and a year later, they can't speak a word of that language. Exactly. I'm not. <laughs> How many people studied, um, you know, uh, quadratic equations in high school and passed the test on it, but yep. can't tell you, can't distinguish a quadratic equation from a cat as an adult, right? <laughs> I know I, mean, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I've even asked scientists if they remember what a quadratic equation is. No, right. I, I have yet to find out anybody who uses quadratic. I'm sure there's somebody who does, but yes. it, it's so arbitrary what's taught in school. And, but whether or not it's valuable what's taught in school, you don't really learn it unless you're interested in it and if you're interested in it you're going to learn it in one way or another or anyway yeah and in this day and age with the rich possibilities through the internet i mean you can you can you can find experts on everything yep. <laughs> everything that you're possibly interested you can find courses if you want to do courses you can find you can find you 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 can get all the help you want generally mm -hmm. free <laughs> you know you yeah. don't need to take a course you don't need and you're in charge when you do it mm -hmm. this way you you can turn that thing off anytime you want and, and you're not hurting anybody's feelings when you do so so right it's uh, it's really a wonderful world now for self-directed education
It is. <laughs> and my oldest son, who is going to be 13 soon, has always been interested in weather and meteorology and, and severe weather. And since he was probably six years old, and I've done nothing to guide his learning in that except offer him the resources that he wants, which he has access on his iPad to the weather channel and he looks at different right. weather patterns on there and he draws weather patterns on printed out maps that we give to him. And I've got him a few books to look at and so he'll read the books and then tell me about them. But it's crazy how much he knows and how little I know about weather, but he'll just sit there and, and talk to me about it and use all of these terms. And I'm like, I did nothing to try to lead you in this except when you asked for something, I gave it to you. And it's just incredible. Yes, exactly. What Whatever he needs, like he right. can get. And we're think, big book lovers in our family too. So I'm, every time I'm like, you wanna learn something? Let's go to the library and get a book about it. And then you can read it to yourself and get out of it what you want, rather than me being like, okay, I'm gonna read this book to you and try to like guide you in this. Cause they're gonna learn what they need from it. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, uh, the fact is that you don't really, that, that you you really can't guide your child <laughs> you know you could your child might use you as a model your ch right. you, you you influence your child more by what you're doing than by who you are by if you're a moral person if you are a person who helps other people if you're those things all influence your ch children are are very interested like all of us children like to eavesdrop they like to hear mm -hmm. what adults are saying and they learn from that they don't like to be taught none of us like to be taught right. you know unless we're asking for it unless we're unless we're asking for it. I, I i remember what i wanted to say that that many people um believe that they can't homeschool mm -hmm. because they don't know the subject matter how can they right. teach their child if they don't know it the truth of the matter is that your child is going to learn all kinds of stuff that you don't know right. <laughs> and you don't need to know it. In fact, it may be better if you don't know it, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, that because if you know it, you may be tempted to try to guide your child in ways that your child doesn't really want to be guided. You know? So yep. I, I remember, you know, I, I mentioned, I talked about my son early on when, so after a year or two of his being, in this self-directed center at Sudbury Valley, we would sometimes go to a museum mm -hmm. and he would always want to go to the medieval uh, rooms. And he would tell me all about the armor, all about the kings and the, what was going on in the medieval history. You know, it, what a delight to mm -hmm. be learning from your child rather than to feel like you're teaching your child. I mean, it wasn't that he felt necessary to teach me. He was just interested in this stuff and talked about yeah. it. And I found it interesting to hear what he had to say about it. Mm -hmm. that, that can happen very quickly. And uh, it really changes the, the nature of the relationship. You know, it's not that you're always the teacher and this child is always the learner or you're the you're the expert and the child is the novice children quickly can become experts in the things that they're really interested in yep absolutely and that was another question i was going to ask you was you know with so many people that are worried about you know not being enough to homeschool their kids they they have this mindset that the teachers in the school who are certified, have their degrees, they're the only ones that could possibly teach their children. And I keep trying to say like, you don't have to have a degree. Anybody, any parent that is willing to take this on can can guide their children in learning or just have that. It, it depends on the environment of your home. If your home is, if you have that mindset of, we can learn anything that you want to learn. You can pursue anything that you want to pursue. Let's have a, a mindset of, I want to learn more things. And I think that's where I come from is I want to learn more. There's so much that I don't know, you know? And so if I have questions, um, then I'll go find answers to them. And likewise with my children. And instead of the testing and the quizzing, we have discussions about things. And most of them are child-led discussions. It'll be questions that they ask me or, or things that they want to bring up. And instead of me saying, 
well, let me tell you about that because I know so much more than you. I'll be like, yeah, that's interesting. What do you think about that? You know, and I'll share what I think, but it's more of a collaboration. And any d discussion that we have, whether it be education-based or just life-based, it's always, let's talk about this. I want to hear your thoughts as well. And I'm not all knowing by any means. <laughs> I've told my kids that I'm like, I don't know everything, but, um, but yeah, that question of people being like, I just don't think I can do it there. You know, the teachers are certified for a reason, you know, and I think that you've answered that question. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, actually, there's several things I could add to that. So as you may know, there's been a huge increase in homeschooling as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. And many of the people who left school for homeschooling during COVID are staying with that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons, I think there's several reasons for that. But I think one of the reasons was that during that period when um, the regular public school was being held online and parents were supposed to sit there with their kids, their right. young kids and watch it, a lot of parents said, whoa, I could do better than that. <laughs> you know, I could, there's no big secret here. <laughs> you right. know? And not only that, but I know my child and I know mm -hmm. my child isn't interested in that the way the teacher is doing. And I would do it in a way if I were teaching and to the mm -hmm. way I'm teaching, I would do it in a way that I know my child would enjoy because I know my child. Yes. So and the, the other thing I can say is there's really, there's, there's no science to teaching. There's no right way or wrong way to do it. And it all depends on, you know, in, in reality, I think the only teaching should that should occur is when a student wants the help and mm -hmm. the student is the guide to the help they want. And then you provide the guide that the student wants. That's the way it ought to work. But even if, let's say, you know, of course, many homeschoolers do teach a curriculum at home and they're trying to do a certain to some degree, something like school at home, although it's never really, fortunately, never really quite like it. Yeah. But think of the, think of the advantage, even if you're doing that, the advantage you have as a homeschooling parent compared to the teacher in school. Mm -hmm. The teacher in school is working under a huge handicap. Number one, there's 30 kids there. Yeah. <laughs> all of whom have different personalities, different interests, different, you can't possibly please them all. You can't right. possibly even get to know them all. The only, you have to teach in a way that you're trying to please everybody and that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So you, so you end up just really requiring people to do what you're telling them to do. And, um, in one way or another, punishing them if they don't do it. And you may not want to do that, but that's what you end up doing, no matter how idealistic you are. So, and secondly, so, so that's first problem is you've got all these kids and, and there's no way to please them all. And secondly, you are under the constraint that the system is telling you exactly what you have to teach. Mm -hmm. You as the teacher may not be the slightest bit interested in this. Right. And if you're not interested, you're certainly not going to get the kids interested if they're not already interested. So you're going through the motions of doing something that nobody in the classroom is interested in. Right. And at home, you know, if you are at least, you know, if, if you're a parent who has some real interest in something, you can present, you can talk about it with a kind of spark and your kids may just because they see that spark in you, they feel a spark about it. And so mm -hmm. it takes, you know, there are some very unusual teachers who are capable of kind of sparking an interest in a large number of kids, but it doesn't last very long. They can do it for a period of time. They can do it in instances. I think most people who've been to school remember that so-called great teacher who who was able to spark an interest, but that was just one teacher and maybe just a few times. And, yeah. and, and that was not the, that was not the bulk of our, of our, of our schooling. Right. Yes. So let's talk for a second about you are, you study neuroendocrinology, right? Which I had to Google. So it's the study of interactions between hormones and the brain right and how it be, right. how it affects our behavior is that correct yes so basically you study people how we develop from birth to death and how how our brains are affecting everything else in our bodies so what did your research show 
from your research, what should all parents know about their children and how can we raise them to be healthy, both physically, mentally, and socially? What would you want all parents to know? Right. So uh, what I think I would want all parents to know is that you can trust your children's instincts. Um, children, you know, we have been what I refer to as the educative animal as long as we've been human beings. Every generation for hundreds of thousands of years learns what they need to know to go mm -hmm. on and become adults. School is new, <laughs> yeah. but education is as old as we are as a species. Mm -hmm. And when researchers who've looked at hunter-gatherer cultures, and I've done some surveys of such researchers about how children in those cultures learn, they don't, they don't really even have a concept of teaching as we usually think of it. They believe that children learn through play and exploration, through involvement in some of what the adults are doing, that, they, that children keep their eyes open and their ears open and they incorporate into their own play the skills that are valuable. Mm -hmm. This is, I believe, how children have always learned. This is human nature. This is what children, children are extraordinarily curious mm -hmm. and they're extraordinarily playful. Curiosity and play are the two major drives underlying education. Curiosity is how you acquire information about the world. You want to know what this thing is. What what right. can I do with it? What do, you know? When, what, what, even ba when we have to baby proof our house because our children want to get into everything, they want to explore everything. What would happen if I drop this face on the floor you know mm -hmm. what would happen if i stuck a bobby pin in that electric outlet so <laughs> we have to you know we have to uh, they're so curious we can't you only you, you can't stop a child a little child from learning an enormous amount unless you lock them away in a closet you don't have to motivate them to learn yeah. you don't have to teach them you can't stop them from doing it mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just human nature and that's that we think of that as characterizing little children because we tend to kill it when we send them to school. Yeah. But if you're not sending them to school, that curiosity continues and it expands and they're curious about broader and broader things. They're not necessarily curious about exactly the same thing that you're curious about. Mm -hmm. And you accept that. <laughs> and they're yeah. not necessarily curious about the things that are being taught in school. And you have to accept that and you have to realize there's those things that are being taught in school are not so essential that your your job is not to produce another you there's already one of you there you don't need another you you know right. your your job as a parent is to is to recognize look this is here's a person who's come into my house <laughs> initially helpless and i have to care for this person otherwise this person wouldn't survive but mm -hmm. as this person is growing, I, I have to realize this person is not my product. <laughs> right. This person is their own person. And my job is not to shape that person into something that I might want that person to be. My job, as presumably we would think of for any guest that we care about, is to learn who this person is <laughs> yeah. and to let this and to help this person be who they want to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the challenge of parenthood. And, and, um, and I think that if you take that view, if you take that approach, you will appreciate your child and your child will appreciate you because you're friends, you're on the same side. You're not, yeah. you're not trying to force the child to be anything that the child doesn't want to be. There are some children who are academically inclined there are mm -hmm. some children who absolutely are not academically inclined. Fortunately, there's plenty of room for both. <laughs> and we yes. need both kinds of personalities. There are some children, there are some children who develop the kinds of passions that lead to the sorts of jobs that I mentioned, where they just really are passionate and then they really become really good at something. But there are some, and we need these kind of people too, who are kind of more laid back and I just want to, you know, I need to make a living and I'll find a good way to make a living. But, you know, I, 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 
we need those kind of people, people who read books as well as people who write books, people who are good neighbors, who are good parents, who are good friends, uh, who are who are good citizens. You know, we the, we need to admire the whole range of personalities, not just the person who's a quote high achiever, whether they're achieving through school or they're achieving outside in, in other kinds of ways. Sometimes I worry a little bit when I talk about the fact that there actually are a lot of unschooled kids who have uh, grown up to become high achievers because they followed their passions. I sometimes worry, well, does that, will, will parents think, well, their child is a failure if the child is not <laughs> right. highly passionate about something? And no, that's not true. You're, I would say the only way to say that your child is a failure and, and that's really not even the right word, that there's something wrong, is if your child is very unhappy. Right. If your child is happy, your child is going to turn out okay. Yeah. <laughs> As an adult. The best predictor of happy adults is happy children. Absolutely. Well, and your, your book is called Free to Learn, and you emphasize, like you've talked about already, the free play for children, just the unstructured exploration that they do. Um, so... Can you explain why you've already talked a little bit about why this is important, but you know, it's one of the reasons why I chose for my boys. I had two boys first and then I have two girls after that. And I was like, I really don't want to send my oldest to preschool because we've been home ever since he was born and he just loves to be active and exploring and running around and going outside when we want to and resting when we want to. And I just don't want to put him in preschool where they might make him sit and and listen to things when he doesn't want to or stop playing when he wants to keep playing and right. so can you just touch a little bit about that about what you've written in your book about the importance of play so, so play is is really um how children learn the most important skills of being a human being <laughs> yeah. it's how they make friends you know for young children a friend is a person you play with mm -hmm. um uh, it's how they learn to get as part of making friends, but even aside from that, it's how they learn how to get along with other people. Because when you're playing socially with other kids, you learn that you have to compromise. You can't have your own way and because one of the freedoms of play is freedom to quit. Your friends will leave you and quit if you try to dominate the play. You have to compromise. You have to play what they want to play as well as what you want to play. You have to play mm -hmm. in ways that are pleasing them. So. It's in play that children learn how to please their peers, keep their peers happy. That's one of the most important skills that anybody, and you can't teach children to do that. You could lecture all day on it. That's not going to help. Children have to learn that by experience. Yeah. It's how children learn to take initiative. I mean, in other parts of life, children are told what to do. They're doing what they have to do. They're being guided by their parents or some other adults, but in play, they are the adults they are the ones who have to solve the problems ideally in play the adults are not present mm -hmm. in fact there's research that indicates that children um, there's actually studies with kindergarten age children that uh, where they show pictures of children engaged in, in uh, what looks like fun activities and ask them is this play or not play and it turns out that the biggest deciding issue for them as whether it's play or not is this is if there's an adult present or not if there's an adult present mm. they assume it's not play because they assume the adult is taking charge of the of the thing <laughs> so play mm. even in children's own view and certainly play scholars and certainly i define it this way play is an activity that is initiated and directed by the players themselves not by some outside right. authority figure it's how children learn to initiate direct their own activities how important that is you know you can't become an adult if you can't do that yeah it's how children as i already said it's how they discover what they love to do it's how they discover their passions play is if all if all you're ever doing is what other people are telling you to do you have no way of discovering what you really like to do and it's, it's so important to discover that you know, I could go on and on. It's also the case that children biologically, when they're really free to play, play at all the various kinds of more specific skills that human beings have to learn. Everywhere. They play with language and they become good at they, they play with reasoning, hypothetical reasoning. They play at building things. They 
they play physically, they play at risky activities and they develop courage this way. They, they play socially as I already described and they develop social competence. So, you mm -hmm. know, you can run through all the active, all the kinds of basic skills, the kinds of skills that can't be taught in school. Mm -hmm. They can't be learned by lectures. They have to be learned by experience. And you'll find that where children have lots of opportunity to play, they play at all of those things. And that's how they develop those skills. Yeah, and that's wonderful. I love it so much. Um, and I, I also wanted to sh sh talk about how you're a founding member of the Alliance of self -Edu Education. And so what made you put that together and what does the organization do? So the idea was to try to bring people together who, um, who um, subscribe to this idea that children learn best when they're in charge of their own education um, to help um, help promote that way uh, to help people who are new to this so they can share but also kind of to present a united um, uh, group who view this so so for example you know there have been schools like Sudbury Valley around for a long time uh, and there's also been unschoolers around for a long time mm -hmm. but they generally don't talk to one another they're generally separate camps <laughs> and but yet they have many of the same beliefs and mm -hmm. um, if we could the idea is if we could find a common terminology self-directed education that unifies this way of thinking then there's a bigger chance of sort of turning this into a movement there's a substantial number of people doing this mm -hmm. and uh, so that was that's part of the rationale is to sort of try to create a movement and the alliance for self-directed education kind of being a center of that it's collecting information it's bringing people together it's providing opportunities in various parts of the country there are groups that uh, the Alliance for Self-Directed Education helps to promote local groups where people can meet with one another who are interested in this and can invite new people who are thinking about it into it, can try to promote it in their own area. So the, the purpose was really to sort of turn, help to turn what is kind of a scattershot group of people doing their own thing mm -hmm. into also something of a social movement. Wow. The, I, what, what we would like to encourage people. So of course, everybody's number one concern is their own children. When people do homeschooling, unschooling, when they send their child to a school like Sudbury Valley, they're doing it for the same reason I initially did it. It's for my own child. It's not part of a mm -hmm. movement. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I think is best for my child. But I think that the next step is to think about children everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. The next step, children can't, you know, we've had all kinds of civil rights movements. We've had civil rights movements for uh, African Americans. We've had civil rights movements for women. We've had civil rights movements for transgender people, for uh, gay people. Mm -hmm. We really need a civil rights movement for children because children are being denied basic civil rights every day in school. They mm -hmm. are being denied what we all think of as the basic American freedoms, the ideal freedoms that should be everybody's freedom everywhere. Yep. And children can't, because children are pretty powerless, they can't organize their own civil rights movement. <laughs> they can't be pushing, they can't push it themselves. Yeah. So we need adults who believe in this and who are going to push this as a movement, make it easier for people to take their children out of school, make it more affordable to do that, try to put pressure on the government to provide funds for people who would uh, not be able to financially support uh, the even the small tuition at a Sudbury school or be able to have somebody at home uh, for homeschooling. The, we need funds, and my, I, a, a big thing I'm interested in that ASDE has helped to start to promote is uh, libraries becoming centers for self-directed education oh, and right. more 
pre more funding for libraries to do this, uh, where children can play at the library and they could do their own thing at the library. A lot of libraries now have maker spaces in them, which is great for self-directed education of a certain Yes, time, so. our library is actually in the works of building one. It's so exciting. Yeah. It's going to be in the basement and it's going to yeah. start, it's going to have like a recording studio and just a large open area for people to congregate. I'm so excited about it. it I love it. Yeah, so these are things that ASD is uh, trying to pro help promote. Uh, we're not the, it's not the only organization doing that, but, um, but is, is kind of a, kind of a center for, uh, for keeping track of these kinds of changes and helping to promote them. I think that's wonderful. And then you're also a board member of the nonprofit Let It Grow. What can you tell us about that? Right. It's actually called Let Grow. Not I'm sorry, the Let it. Grow. But, <laughs> yeah, the it would be your child. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> so so uh, Lenore Skenazy wrote the book Free Range Kids. It came out two or three years before my book, Free to Learn. And so I read her book and I... I, I saw that she and I, with very different approaches, very different styles, we're very different people, uh, we're, we're promoting the same message. And so I said to myself, I really have to get to know this woman. Um, we're, to, we're singing the same song by different <laughs> tunes. But the, uh, and so I invited her to a conference on play. It was an academic conference, and she's not an academician. She's actually a comedian, and she uh, she had the academics rolling in the aisles with her with her <laughs> talk. And and I got to know her, and we became uh, friends. And we um, and so we talked about how um, how we might work together. And and at the same time, there were a couple of other people. Um, who uh, Lenore had gotten to know, uh, who were interested in this. So we founded this organization, Let Grow. And um, it's a nonprofit organization. And um, unlike ASD, its mission is not to um, get kids out of school. It's not against kids getting out of school. But and, and Lenore has spent the same things I do about the constraints of school. But it's really provide uh, support for children's independent activities uh, wherever it may occur, including and maybe especially in typical schools. Mm -hmm. So we are um, bringing certain interventions into schools that are interested in having more play at school. What can the school do? How can the school bring more play, more independent adventure into children's lives? And so one of the innovations that actually I developed is uh, something that schools call play club, which is oh. an hour of free play at school in elementary schools where all the children of all grades are playing together. It's age mixed play and sometimes involves the whole school indoors as well as outdoors. Mm -hmm. And the, there are no rules at play club except that you can't hurt anybody or break anything valuable. And, um, and there may be sometimes 150 or more kids all playing at once at the school. And most schools do this because they don't want to sacrifice school time, unfortunately. They do this either before school or after school. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a great success. And um, the kids are developing a much better feeling about school. They're making friends, including friends of kids in other grades. They're developing. Um, it's not as much play as children need, but it's a lot more play than many of the children had previously been getting. And it's real play. It's free play. And there's all kinds of interesting things you can do. So a lot of schools have adopted that. Uh, we're now, the state of New Hampshire is now doing a big research project that I helped to design uh, to look at the effects of introducing Play Club in an experimental way. Mm -hmm. And the other intervention, one that Lenore um, particularly developed, and she had already kind of experimented with it, is uh, in a way an easier one for the schools to adopt, which is, we call it just the Let Grow Project. And it's basically an assignment that teachers give to the children in their class. And again, this is in elementary schools, typically, although there are now some middle schools doing it too. Um, but it's an assignment in which the students are asked to do something at out of school that they've never done before. That's mm -hmm. a little bit scary. 
uh, that maybe their parents are hesitant to have them do, but they've got to get their parents' permission. They can't do it without their parents' permission. And they negotiate with parents about something that they want to do that's maybe a little bit scary, that's a little bit adventurous. And, um, and so, you know, it might be something like, just to give an example, it might be uh, maybe there's a 10-year-old girl who uh, has never been allowed to ride her bicycle on her own. She can only ride her bicycle in the driveway <laughs> or, uh, or with a parent going with her. Mm -hmm. She wants to ride her bicycle by herself. And so she says, for my Let Girl Project, I want to ride my bicycle to my friend's house two blocks away all by myself. And maybe the mom says, no, that would be too afraid. I can't let you do that. That's too dangerous. And so then maybe she negotiates and say, well, how about if I just ride around the block? I won't go across any streets. I'll just go around the block on the sidewalk and you can sit here and watch me leave and come back. <laughs> and so maybe the parent agrees to that. Uh, maybe after riding with the child around the block <laughs> herself first. So then the child does this. You know, by the way, this is something, I mean, 10 year olds used to ride all over the city by themselves. You know, this is something yeah. that in the past was absolutely completely common. But amazingly, many parents, in fact, most parents today don't allow their kids to do things like this anymore. Mm -hmm. We're so concerned about the dangers, so overly concerned. That's, that's uh, Lenore's big issue is how we are unrealistically concerned about dangers. And the result of that is we're depriving our children of the adventures that they need mm -hmm. really to grow up, to develop uh, a sense of confidence and uh, that they can handle things in this world. So the genius of this is that because it's a school assignment, the parent has to take it seriously. She can't, the parent can't just dismiss it and mm -hmm. say, oh no, I would never let you do that. I'm not even gonna talk about it. The parent at least has to come to some kind of a compromise. Otherwise this child is, is, has not fulfilled the school assignment and parents, if anything, are concerned about, about their kids doing well in school, right? So this yeah. is, uh, that's really the genius of this. And then what, Lenore discovered in early trials of this is once an, a parent agrees to one adventure, even if it's kind of a lame adventure, um, now the child's open, to, the parent is open to something a little more adventurous the next time. It's like the parent is changing. The parent realizes, well, my child enjoyed that so much. And the parent feels proud about the child doing it too. And the parent feels proud about himself or herself allowing the child to do it. And the parent develops a different, it sort of breaks into that cycle of fear and creates a different kind of cycle that counters the cycle of fear, a cycle of, I want my child to do more and more independent things. And yeah. so it has that. And so each time this assignment is given, there's a tendency for the adventure to be a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit something that maybe is a, an actual real adventure and uh, a test of the child's courage and that something that helps the child develop courage. So those are examples of things that we're doing um, through Let Grow. It's uh, more and more schools are adopting this. Um, I would encourage parents, whether you're homeschoolers or have your kids going to a regular school, whatever the situation is, to take a look at the site. There are a lot of, inter Lenora writes a regular blog about uh, examples of children doing things uh, on their own and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, resources on the site that can be helpful to parents as well as to teachers. Uh, a lot of it is oriented towards teachers to try to get teachers to uh, provide more adventures for children. Wow. I think that's so wonderful. I'll definitely be checking out that website as well. And I just love what you're doing. And I'm so, so grateful that you came to talk to me today. The last thing I wanted to ask you was just where can people find you? I saw that you have a, a sub stack as well on, uh, on your website. Too. Yes. I, 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 I'm hoping people will come to, this is a new thing that I'm doing. I was encouraged by a number of people to start writing a sub stack. I've long been writing a blog for psychology today magazine. Right. I have something like 200, somewhat more than 200 essays on, and you can find those easily enough. Just Google Peter Gray psychology today My blog is called freedom to learn, mm -hmm. but psychology today made a decision um, a couple of years ago 
to not allow comments. And that in, that kind of partly ruined it for me because I always mm -hmm. enjoyed the comments. I learned from them. I would sometimes even do little polls through the through the comments system and um, and then write a new blog based on what people said. And it was always a lot of fun. So people began to encourage me to do Substack, which does allow comments and, and, and also Substack. So I, I decided finally to start a Substack. It's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more scholarly academic oriented, but that doesn't mean it's not for parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not being written with technical language. I, it's really the title of the Substack is to, is, uh, is play makes us human. Okay. And I really believe that's true. I believe that play, that the qualities of ourselves that we think of as human, as our human qualities, our qualities that have come about from play. I, I what I suggest in this, in the, one of my early essays is that play serves three fundamental functions. One is learning of skills, which we've been talking about here. But another is inventiveness, play, you know, people who invent things often talk about it as in play. Initially, I was just wanted to see what would happen if I did this or that. This is just playing around with stuff. This is what, this is what kids are doing with, uh, with those um, uh, in the library <laughs> with, with the 3D printers and the stuff that's available there. And mm -hmm. so this is this is how computers came about nobody knew what a computer was going to be for these were just young people playing around with this stuff yeah. what could we do here you know <laughs> so that, so our cultural innovation and then finally our cooperation our ability to get along with one another now we don't get along with one another purposely as well as we should mm -hmm. but i truly believe that if we all adopted a more playful approach to life we would be getting along to get with one another much better it's when we take when, when we take ourselves too seriously and we and we get all angry about things <laughs> and we mm -hmm. and play brings us together well i will leave a link um in the description too for everybody to uh be able to find that as well is there anywhere else that you're at that you want people to find you at <laughs> well there, it's not too hard to find me i also have a relatively new website other people had encouraged me to have my own website uh, not just the website that's at boston college which doesn't have much on it so i have a website it's easy to find petergray.org <laughs> you'll okay. get to the website one thing you can find on that website, is, if you're interested, are PDFs of many of my academic articles. They're all readable. I don't. I write in pretty simple language, no matter who I'm writing for. And uh, there are also on that site there are various YouTube's of talks I've given. Um, there, uh, and there are links to uh, organizations that I've been involved in. So if you want to find out more about what I've done, if you want to read some of the research I've done, um, you can easily find that on, on my website. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak to me today. I think it was such a wonderful conversation and so, so helpful. Well, thank you again for having me on. I, I wish you well. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.